Hi, I'm Marco from the Artificial Intelligence Student Society and I will be introducing to you the recordings of our Julia course which we held from November 23rd to December 10th, 2020. The teacher of this course is Luca Manzoni. He's a researcher at the Department of Mathematics and Geosciences at the University of Trieste, Italy, and he uses Julia regularly for his work. The course is composed of three lectures of two hours each, in the first lecture, uh, there will be an introduction to the Julia language in its standard library. The lecture two, two instead, will present some uh, uh, packages for machine learning, uh, especially plots, data frames, and flux. And in lecture three, instead, you will see other uh, packages, one for the differential equations and one for probabilistic programming. And also, you will uh, learn to do some benchmark with benchmark tools. So, this is a basic part for beginners. Uh, feel free to skip it if you already know uh, the basics about installing Julia and Jupyter Notebook. Uh, to install Julia, just navigate to julialang.org and you will find a download link. Then you need to install Jupyter. For novice users, we suggest to install Anaconda, the individual edition, so anaconda.com navigate to products and individual edition and you will find all the download links at the bottom of the page. Next you need to add the package iJulia in order to be able to run the Jupyter Notebooks with the Julia kernel. If you are on Linux as I am right now you need to open a terminal and run Julia by simply typing Julia. The same can be achieved on Windows just running the Julia executable after it has been installed. Next we need to type using pkg and then you type pkg.add and iJulia in quotes. So after you have done so you can open Jupyter Notebook and on Linux or Mac, as I am right now, you just open a terminal and type Jupyter-Notebook or on Windows, you type Jupyter Notebook on the search bar and open the executable. A new window will open up on your browser. You just navigate to the location where the package, the notebook, is present type on it and the notebook will open up. You see that there are some cells, some are text cells, others are code cells. To run the code cells you just hit Ctrl Enter or Shift Enter. In case you needed to add a package you can do it right here in the same way that I showed you before. So you create a new cell, type using pkg and then pkg.add and the package that you need to install. For example, I will be installing Flux here, which is the package for machine learning applications. And you see now that the package will be installed. We are now ready to start playing the recordings. If you enjoyed this course and these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. And if you want to keep in touch with us and be informed about our future initiatives, just follow us on Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn. Okay, so, first of all, let's start by looking at say at the base in this case on uh, how we can define and declare variables we don't actually need to declare a variable we can simply assign a value to it and uh, while a variable by itself uh, has can contain unless we will see we have some annotation any type, the content of a variable, uh, the value bound to a variable has a type, 
in this case, a 64-bit integer. However, we can assign other values, so for example, in this case, 3.4, and we will see that the type of the value bound to the variable is now a floating point. And we actually have an entire collection of numerical values. And uh, for example, we have rational, which is in this case, allows us to work with fractions without losing any precision due to floating point approximations. We directly have complex number. We use IM for the imaginary part. And as you can see, we can have rationals where both the denominator and the denominator are integer, complex number when the real and the imaginary part are both represented as floating point numbers and so on. And uh, all the common operations like uh, addition, subtractions, uh, multiplication, and so on, works on all the numerical types, like sum of fraction will result in another fraction. And uh, also multiplication will works with complex number. If I use, for example, to Python, you have the double asterisk to have uh, for the exponential, while in Julia, we use the caret to, to the 10, for example, here. And for integer division, instead, we can use this division symbol. And uh, how can we write it if you are either in the app, it is on the command line or in the notebook, you can simply write as attack div press tab and it is replaced by the corresponding symbol. This is all for most of the symbols in Julia. We can write it as in LaTeX, write tab and in both in the notebook and in the app, they will be uh, 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 completed. So, as if we want instead of the integer division, we want a reminder, we use the patient sign is, it is common in most modern languages. Okay. So, in addition to upper numbers, we have the ability to represent character and strings. Characters uh, as uh, UTF-8 characters, and uh, they are represented by enclosing them in single quotes. So we have traditional ASCII characters, and also Unicode characters are valid. So you don't have to work with different types for uh, for um, Unicode and non-Unicode strings, Unicode and non-Unicode characters and the Unicode and non-Unicode strings. For strings, we can have them enclosed, string literals are enclosed by double quotes or triple double quotes, and they can contain new lines. So we have hello world, or hello world this time with a new line, we can enclose it in single or double quotes. Why two ways of enclosing the string? Well, because it is 
sometimes if we have a lot of double quotes, this may be easier to enclose everything in triple double quotes without having to escape everything with a backslash. Differently from uh, other languages where concatenation is of strings is done with a plus. Here it is done with uh, an asterisk, more like with multiplication. And so we can also concatenate string. We can also use the function join. Strings can easily be interpolated because we can have that, we can replace part of a string with a value by prepending it with the dollar sign. So the value of X is dollar X will replace dollar X with four. And if we use the two parentheses to enclose an expression, we can replace the value of the expression inside the string. So, and we can also use, since we have defined X, we can use actually any expression. So that we have easiest thing is the population. You can be familiar with it, for example, in Python, when you use F strings that were, that were introduced only recently. And by prepending the quotes by um, another symbol that more, many are possible, we can have uh, different kinds of string literals. For example, prepending everything with a B will give the binary vector represented by the string. In this case of eight bit unsigned integers. Or for example, we have a support for regular expression. We can simply can use R before starting the string. So these things we actually represent a regular expression that can be used to match text inside another string. A special kind of types is the symbol type, which is uh, used by, uh, which is written by colon and then a name. What is the volume of colon foo? Is foo. What is the type of foo? It is not a string, it is a symbol. Like symbol are in time as strings and uh, they can be used, for example, with as keywords. And we will see that they are also used in uh, macros. And uh, they should be quite familiar with people working with uh, list like languages. Just think of it as another way of representing a name, except that using a string, I now we use a symbol that can also be represented more efficiently by the compiler. We'll see some uses of symbols in the following one. So I wanted to take a few minutes before each part of the lecture to answer some questions that may arise. So if everyone has a question, please write it to the chat or ask it directly. And I will try to answer. So do we have access to the recording of the lectures? Yeah. I'm sorry, hi, uh, Luca. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I got in late because of an issue with Microsoft uh, uh, Teams. Yeah. Uh, can you just say um, th this material, is it in the, in the, 
like the, the yeah in the, um, in the repository that uh, we have uh, access to or where do i find it, this stuff it is in the teams uh, chat ah okay uh, yeah is uh, the lecture one the uh, python notebook and uh, okay for binary values and symbols we have uh, your questions okay okay so but uh, i will start with the binary values and uh, binary values simply instead of having this represented as a by as a string of unique or the code points we have actually a vector of uh, uh, eight bit integers and sign eight bit integers so maybe we want to work directly on the on the um, byte level and so we can use this binary value okay so for symbols well uh, we still have if they are related to factors in some sense in fact and um, let's say factors are in some sense a set of let's say I don't want to say the same as symbols, but say quite similar to symbols. It is that you can use how you can use symbols, you can use it them as keywords. For example, we have a function f and we have uh, a few parameters and then we have a keyword, which is uh, maybe method if we have uh, some kind of optimization method. If, for example, in Python, we usually write it is, as a string method, we say very cool method. In Julia, we usually use it as a symbol. Why? Because, well, a symbol can be, first of all, a symbol coming from the list heritage of Julia can be optimized out by uh, in uh, uh, by the compiler and it is And uh, this is a sense better than uh, in this case for string, and we will use it. Uh, we will see how we use it for uh, markers in uh, the next part of the lecture. Let's think about the symbol. Why you have number? What is the value, for example, of the number seven is seven. The value of the symbol bar is bar. Of the symbol foo is foo. It's something that evaluates itself. Okay, it's like every object is a pointer, or also do we have the possibility to store variables with a bit of long binary precision? We have. Starting from the last question, you have big integers. And uh, so you can have arbitrary precision. Well, every object is a pointer. Well, not actually, because uh, if you use, for example, an array that is made entirely of floating point values, you will not have pointers in that case you will actually have an array of floating point values. This is uh, why type annotation are useful because we can have a type that is any that is a, will actually be represented as a pointer to some kind of object. But if we know the type, 
we can uh, improve the performances by actually specifying it and have everything as um, say everything uh, say as an array of uh, let's say as a, a standard C or for example array. Okay, so the word don't need to be processed on this thing. Okay, can we use symbols now? Maybe if you try to do this, if you have say type of one, two, three, four, this would be an integer because Maybe what we actually want is uh, to have to use symbol, which is the radical construct uh, instead of using the, mm, the column. Symbol one, two, three, four, create the symbol represented in the one, two, three, four. Okay. So you can also create symbols with symbols and what we what we actually want to create a symbol, the name of the symbol. So, okay. Okay, is there any other question? Seems uh, I missed. Some other question, it seems not. So let's continue with IA, dictionary, tuples, and so on. So IAs, I define like Python list uh, as a syntax. You have this IA, it's one dimensional IA of, in this case, we'll see of integer, 64 bit integers. Well, since we have instantiated it only with integers. And uh, we can actually uh, find what is the type of the element of V by using the function L type. We say that all elements contained in the vector are integer of uh, 64 bits. And we can obtain the length of the vector with simply length of V. We can have uh, vectors, actually arrays, types. And in this case, you can see that array, one dimensional array of elements of type any. In this case, since the elements are not uniform in type, we'll have some uh, decrease in uh, in efficiency. And then something that can be quite controversial for people that want to write in C or um, in C or um, Python is that in Julia, our array starts for, uh, from one. And so the last element of the array is at length of the array and not length minus one. But this is true for the standard built-in array, but you can use the packages called offset arrays when uh, you can start at any position. So for example, if you want to work, for example, with uh, uh, for the coefficient and you want to start uh, with uh, uh, negative numbers for the first uh, index, you can start with it using offset arrays. And we see that they work more or less everywhere. And if you don't want to remember what is the first and the last element, you can simply start with begin and end. 
which is the first and the last element of the array. As with many modern languages, like Python, you can slice arrays. So you can have a slice, you can express it as starting number, colon, and starting index, colon, ending index. In this case, the both are included. And we can assign a slice to other variables, but in this case, the IA is copied, not, uh, this is not a reference. Uh, we have a question, I begin and end keywords. There are also keywords. And uh, in fact, if we modify the array, w, the array w, which we obtain from a slice of V, we see that V has not been modified. However, we can obtain a, a view of an array by using view and uh, the slice to take. So Z is now, you can see that the type now is different. Is the type is a view of an array of 64 byte in, uh, uh, byte, uh, bit integers. And now if we modify Z, we also modify the original array, the uh, V. And in fact, we can actually work with view in multidimensional cases also and uh, so we can decide if we want to have a copy or to work directly on the original array. One thing to notice is that both in the copy in and in the view, the first element is still one, even if in the view it corresponds to position two in the, uh, in the original array. One thing that was made uh, famous, at least uh, in the Python world by the NumPy package is broadcasting. That is, for example, you can take a slice and assign a value, the same value to all the elements in the slice. Except that this does not work uh, directly in Julia. What we have is that we have to explicit, explicitly ask for broadcasting by pretending to assignments or to function calls to, uh, or to more or less everything, a dot. This means uh, that uh, this assignment operator is now broadcasted. So the four is now assigned to all the elements between one and three. We can have multidimensional arrays and they are different from arrays of arrays. This is something in sport we'll see. How, first of all, we can easily write multidimensional arrays by separating everything with spaces or semicolons. Things that are separated by semicolons or new lines are concatenated vertically. And things that are separated by spaces or tabs are concatenated horizontally. So this means that if you write a matrix like a matrix, it actually represents a matrix. If you can see an array of 64-bit integers of with two dimensions. And we can obtain the number of dimensions of a multidimensional array by using n beams. Okay, how do we make a three dimensional array? We are going to see it in a short time. Uh, 
and uh, we can ask for a specific size, uh, the size of a specific dimension using the size function, size and the dimension. So in the second dimension is four, in the first dimension is three. And if we ask size of M, we are throwing the tuples with a row and columns. And uh, for indexing, we use the name of the array and that all the indexes separated by commas. Notice that this is not equivalent to this. In fact, this is an error. Why? Because there is a difference between multidimensional arrays and arrays of arrays. So, for example, M2 here is an array of array, and you can see in the type that it is one dimensional array, was element are one dimensional arrays. So, if we do M2, 1, 2, it works, but since M is two dimensional array, we have to use this different notation for indexing. Appending new element. Okay, this uh, was for the next part, but we can see it. Let's go back here, for example. And uh, we have a uh, push the vector and the value to add. We have modified the vector V by adding a new element. Notice that in Julia, the both of the functions, it is a convention. It is not enforced by the languages, but it is a convention to have all the functions that modify the arguments to have a bang at the end so we know that push will modify its uh, argument. And similarly, we have pop, this time without an argument, that will remove the last element. And now V in fact, is smaller. So, a guiding, then uh, let's go forward. Then we we'll move also to higher number of dimensions. So, as before, we can perform slicing for uh, functions, uh, for uh, uh, multi dimensional arrays. We can have slice in both. Rows and columns. Do push and pop are allocated arrays? It may, it may happen. What well, they still need to okay for on large matrices, uh, it's better to use to the arrays or arrays arrays. Why well, they're not actually the same. But uh, most of the function, for example, in linear algebra, in the linear algebra packages, work with two-dimensional arrays, not with arrays of arrays. At least, but you can easily convert from one to the other. So we can also decide to slice only one dimension to say take everything in the other dimension. We use simply the column and the same if it is the first argument. And we can, as before, create views of two dimensional arrays. Simply we have to pass more indexes 
company A who have created a view of the matrix M, taking two of the rows and four of the, or in three of the columns, we can reshape the matrix, for example, uh, three by four to a four by three. And I shape also in multiple dimensions. Okay. There's a question I didn't understand what view does. Okay, views, instead, when you assign a view to a variable, where you create a view, if you modify the elements inside the view, you modify also the elements inside the original array. So if you modify, for example, the matrix, let's go back to the matrix, the original matrix M, since we now have emphasized it, the three by four matrix, we have this matrix A, which is a view of the matrix M. We say A11 equals 99. And now let's print M. M has been modified in this case. Okay. Don't call uh, the array. Arrays are as important. And possibly uh, for scale array, array plus array in my product. Wow. Yes, I was going to explain that in the in uh, the next part of the lecture. By slicing an array for array, okay, you have to slice, uh, the, for example, slice M2. If you take, for example, M2 from one to two, and then you have to split again for example, for one to two, you actually get nothing because now you, what you have is still an array of array, and then when you index it again, you are indexing this one. So use the uh, multidimensional arrays is uh, more or less the. Okay. And for creating multidimensional arrays, you can use also this sequence because you can then, you have a two dimensional array, you can then concatenate it horizontally or vertically, but but I way could be either to use one of the functions that immediately create an array, a multidimensional array, like for example, you have uh, once and you have in this case you can so that means to yes. once you can create an array of one so you can maybe shape an array that you have created different ways you can see you can create multi-dimensional array, but they are, unfortunately, since we are working on a two-dimensional screen, they are not as nice to represent as the matrix. So in addition to multi-dimension, uh, to defining arrays by writing explicitly, Uh, instead of using a view, may just use uh, M I J M N for the Python into many. If you assign directly, then you have M I J. 
uh, M N equal with maybe with or without broadcasting, depending what you want to do. Uh, something that you modify the original line, right? but if you have to to assign this M I J If you have to assign M I J to um, to another variable, then it is copied, and then you cannot modify the original. So in this case, you want a view. If you cannot apply for the modification directly by putting something like M one two two three. equal five, then we write M. So in this case, we can directly modify, but if we're to assign this to something else, to a variable, then we have a copy. And uh, again, in the question on once, once if we have, for example, two, four, three, Creates an array. In this case of plot, you can change the type of all ones of dimension two by four by three. We have similarly for zeros and uh, that are easy, quite easy to create in this case. So moving forward. We also have IA comprehension, which works in languages like Python. And uh, for example, we have, we want all the squares of the order number in between one and 10. We have these uh, functions or let's say an expression for I in, and then we say the range one to 10. And we can create also multi-dimensional array in this way by using multiple variables, i, j, i times j for i from one to five and j from one to five. We can also obviously have different ranges. In this case, we have rows for i and column for j. And actually what we have is that Without the, uh, the square brackets, the, this part is, is a generator. Uh, they can actually be used in many other cases. In addition to arrays, most modern languages also provide dictionaries that maps a set of keys to a set of values. So, if we want to create a dictionary, we can create it empty, for example, by using dict. Uh, we say that it's a map from any type to any type. Or we can create it by adding some elements to the base. So A, the value of A is one, of B is two, or C is three. So we have this dictionary or associative array this time from characters to integers. We can index dictionaries in a similar way as arrays, except that we can use any of the keys. And we can assign to also to non-existing keys and these were inside the key in the dictionary. The dictionary needs to be hash tables. Well, a dictionary as it is implemented is it is actually as an hash table. At least in the implementation with the in the dict implementation with Julia, we also have some uh, an extra dictionary, so we can have something. Okay, uh, interesting question. 
and maybe something like this. This is also a valid dictionary, except that instead of being of the fixed types, we feed of type from any to any. I dictionary all that, not necessarily. And we can obtain the set of keys of a dictionary by simply calling the function keys and the same for the function values for to obtaining all the values. As with many other languages, we have these uh, product types that are tuples. Tuples are immutable and are container, con fixed led containers where every element can be of a different type. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I want, I was to answer yes. No. Usually if uh, it is not direct, there is packages for almost everything. <laughs> so yes, also for all the addiction. So we can have tuples. For example, this tuple simply contains three elements. And uh, if we look at the type of the tuple, we have this tuple of a float, an integer, and a string. We can access the elements of the tuple by S with arrays, with uh, position indexes for one to the length of the tuple, so tuple of one. And if you want to create a tuple that is uh, of only one element, since we can have a, is this ambiguous, this syntax, if we have parentheses three, close parentheses, to, not, to force it to be actually a tuple, we add at the end a comma. So this is a tuple of only one element. We can have named tuples like in Python and uh, simply by adding the, sim the name for the elements and we can access them with the dot notation like if they are members of, maybe members of numbers. So named tuple B is two. And an important thing is that, as I said, tuples are immutable so maybe tuples dot b equal five. We like to, uh, an error because immut because tuples are, as you said, immutable. We uh, Julia support the structuring of tuples. This means that uh, uh, we have a tuple as uh, the right hand side of an assignment. On the left hand side, we can have multiple variables separated by commas. And the tuples will be unpacked. So this tuple, which contained 1.22 and hello, will have assigned to x 1.2 to y, as we see here, 2 and to z hello. Okay. Okay, can a symbol be used? I see there are some questions. Okay, yeah, yeah that's a start with JR is the package that you want. And um, we will use random in the next for the multidimensional, um, to generate a random multidimensional array. Um, Yes, tuple, name tables are immutable, dictionary are immutable. Can we use symbols? Well, we can use symbols anywhere, everywhere, more or less. So 
so they can also be used and actually if you want to use if you have a fixed set of strings to use maybe use symbols cast explicit casting the type will be discussed later there is this function convert that uh, can be used to convert an, uh, something to another type but we will see it later okay so let's move to function and we can have named functions which is normal function which is simply started with the keyword function the name of the function the uh, the arguments are separated by comma and uh, ended by end And we see that we have the generic function with one method. We will see next what would, does it mean that it has one method. Actually, we don't need the return keyword if what we want to return is the last expression inside the function. So x plus one is an expression. So add one version two is actually equivalent to add one. Because we are returning the value of this, of the last expression being evaluated. If we have a function that can be defined with only one line, we may decide not to use function and function keyword, simply add one, name of the function, open parenthesis, list of arguments, equals, and then the function. If we want, we can have value um, uh, function returning multiple values we can simply separate them as uh, the return value by comma this will return a tuple and uh, that we can unpack unpack when we assign the result of the function For example here we will have a plus seven m equals to r so we can return multiple values. And this is all quite standard. And we can also have keyword arguments. They are separated by normalized standard arguments with a semicolon when we define the function. And we can say add the const, for example, the function adds constant, the takes x and constant which by default is zero we can avoid using the keyword argument and uh, this will assume the default value of zero or we can add it add the keyword argument as and um, change it from the default the default value Notice that if we modify it a little at constant version two, it is still a keyword argument, but now we have to specify its value, which since we don't have a default. And the keyword arguments are, for example, uh, um, a place where uh, symbols can be used for example if you want to say which you have a selection across a limited number of um, methods like you have in python you usually pass a string as a keyword argument you can pass here a symbol okay
the function, we don't want the function to, to everything. Okay, yes, it's quite not with convert, but usually the conversion of types, uh, between types, usually you, if I mean to convert, you can enter nothing, which to enter nothing, which is nothing. Can you have a function with a binary number of arguments? Yes. It's this time also with splat like you have function f and here you will have a, a list a list of all the things passed as arguments so for example sum x F of one, two, three, three. six, and uh, okay, Q one is X a Q one argument or just a constant? Uh, in uh, function f, yeah, I, I think the the question came before uh, the your definition of the function f. Okay, in function at constant. Uh, Two. Ah, okay. Add constant two. Uh, okay, all the keyword arguments are after the semicolon. So X is a Neumann argument. Constant is a keyword argument. Okay. Uh, the order is not important for keywords. And let's see if I have uh, the other question. Okay, let's turn. Okay. So, what about uh, anonymous functions? Well, anonymous or lambda functions, well, you you define it, for example, in Python with the lambda keyword, but they are pretty limited with respect to normal lambda functions. With uh, Julia, you can create them by, for example, tuples of the arguments, then another, and then simply write the function. Notice that this is a function without any name. So actually we, but we can assign it to variables. Uh, yeah, because we have defined F before. So F F. Um, and uh, what we have is that this is now a variable containing function. If we have a type of FF will we'll obtain this, this, this particular anonymous function. And we can call it and pass it as argument and so on. So we can use it also as arguments to other function. And we can also use broadcasting with the functions. So if we call FF, we, for example, with two elements, the two arrays as arguments, we say that we have nothing matching this. What we can do 
is add before the function call, so before the open parentheses, a dot meaning to broadcast function calls, or it will be applied in this case to any pair of elements. Can you limit? Okay, can you limit the type of function x? Uh, yes, we will see it for types, and actually this is one important part because we will uh, use it for uh, what's called multiple dispatch. And uh, the definition of the anonymous function, well, you have assigned it. Well, the anonymous function is defined we define that we are so maybe if we uh, you assign it to multiple to multiple variables then well you have uh, it would not change after so Turning to the vector, when we we can also broadcast standard arithmetical operations since they are actually function calls. So that by propending them with a dot. So we have the this this time once will be broadcasted and summed to all the elements by us. So when a function, we still have some basic building blocks that we need to have, some selection and iteration, selection performed with if. Notice that we don't have like in Python a colon and we end it with end. And we can have multiple condition concatenated multiple boolean condition concatenated as for in a C-like way, for, so for and or or, we can have an else part of each if, we end everything with an and as before, and we can have multiple else, um, if else, if else, and so on, by using else if and well this may be the difficult part to remember since it seems that every language decide to write it differently else if else if, else if since without the e and so iteration with while is say the standard while while condition execute the body we have still working continue but we will not see them here. So point four works like uh, is the notation acquired? The notation is not uh, not acquired, but please uh, because we have the end that actually denotes the end of the code, but is in the, in the, the code. For yourself and for the people writing the code after you. Adding the color. So for a construct, it works similarly to Python. So we have four variables in something that can be iterated, some container. So for V in one the array containing one, two, three, or from we can also add a range for one, two, five. And uh, since uh, Unicode is everywhere now, if you write backslash in, like in LaTeX and press tab, you can have the in symbol and it works exactly the same as in. So 
but for many kinds of um, iterations, we can actually use some kind of functional construct, some higher order function like map, reduce, or filter without using explicitly a loop. So, for example, map as a is a function that requires two arguments. The first is a function, a unary function that will be applied to all the elements of the second argument. So in this case, map, map this is an anonymous function. This is some, a common use of anonymous function inside map. The map x to x squared plus x. So what you obtain is an, L, is an array in which to each element the, this fu anonymous function was applied and use instead applies a binary function to merge all the elements in a single value so reduce with plus of the vector v we perform 4 plus 5 the, the result plus 6 the result plus 7 the result plus 3 and turn the, result, uh, the final result And since many of those are come, a do generator exist? Yes, generator is actually what we uh, also used for uh, um, array comprehension. If you don't add the um, uh, square brackets, so. Since we have some kind of uh, since some kind of reduction are extremely common, like finding the minimum, the maximum, performing the sum of the products, they are already defined and they are preferred instead of the writing them directly. We can use filtering of an array when we have a function that returns a boolean that can be used to filter all the elements expecting a certain condition. So we have this array V and we can reduce, uh, we can filter all the elements that are at least five and we can write uh, greater or equal as in an, many programming languages with two characters. So uh, like in LaTeX, greater or equal, press tab and it will compete with greater or equal. So this will return an element of all the elements that are greater or equal that than uh, um, five. Let's look for now how, how we can combine many different operations working on the same data and. Uh, Let's say, for example, we have this vector v, which is a, a vector of 10 random numbers within 0 and 1. Or actually, since we remove 0 0.5 by broadcasting, they are between minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. We can, for example, compute the square, the sum of the square of all the positive values inside the array. What we can do, we can do it with a filter, a map, and then some reduction. Except that this is quite common when we have that the output of this, of this function is the input of the next and so on until the end. So what we have is that we can have some kind of pipe operator, which is similar to what you can find, for example, in R, or what is the trading macros in the closure. So what we have is that filter, we return an array of values. We apply this that square the elements. Look at how we use broadcasting to square all of the elements. Then we perform the sum. So if we have, 
in general, the notation X, this pipe F, means that F is applied to X. So X pipe F pipe G pipe H means that we have we apply H of G of F of X, which is something quite common since we have that the output of a function application is the input of the next one. Okay, that is the piping. Well, I think I have answer. Yes. So, we're piping, we can actually reduce on more or less everything. And now we go to one of the inter most interesting parts of Julia, which is how we can can we use types and why we are not only working with a slightly different version of Python, because until now everything we've seen is not that different from Python, except for the speed. So what we have is that everything is typed in uh, Julia. And we can type, for example, function eigen. So for example, we can say that F will only works on real numbers, which is actually a type containing multi, which is a super type of say all the real numbers. And uh, we have we add this type annotation by double colon and then the type. And we can see that F works perfectly for when we pass, for example, floating point numbers. But if we try to pass a string, we say that there is no method matching F on the yes, we since we have not defined an F function F that can work on strings. We can also type variables. So for example, V is an array of integer of a one dimensional array of 64 bit integers. And if you have noticed some types like this array of 64 in 64 one, And uh, this array of integer 64 one is uh, actually, uh, array is a parametric type since uh, we can have array of any type and any number of dimensions. You can think of them, they are type parameters, these kind of integer 64 one, so you can think of it as something similar, but not too much to template in C++ or, or generics in, uh, in Java. We can also have, for example, a union of types. For example, we can define a U things that can be, for example, either 32 bit integer or 64 bit floats as a union of two types. And why this can be useful? Well, before because we can have, for example, the missing type. Missing types is a particular type that is used to type missing with the capital M, contains only one value, the value missing with the small m, which is used to indicate that we have a missing value. So for example, if we say that we have an IA, that can contain said uh, floats or missing values. We can type it as array. What type is a union on float and missing values. And then, for example, we can filter removing everything that is not that is missing. So keeping everything that is not missing. And uh, 
on the ID, and then we pay for sum. So we define this function, and we can see that it works with missing. An interesting thing with missing is that a missing value plus a number is a missing value. And you can think of the NA in R, which is different from, in this case, from nothing. And um, because, well, missing represent missing value, nothing represents the something point, points to nothing, more or less. And in addition to tuples, we can actually define other kinds of product types by using struct. For example, this is struct of pairs. Uh, the structure represents a pairs with the first and the second element. It's pair uh, structs by default are immutable. So we can create it with the name of the struct and the elements that it has to contain. And we see the type, we have defined a new type that is my pair in this case, and we can use it for typing also. And with the dot notation, we can access all the values inside the structure. And in particular, as I said, as I just said, tuple uh, structs are immutable. So we get an error in this case. If you want a mutable structure, we have to write it explicitly. And we have a mutable structure, my mutable pair in this case. And in we can create it and we can modify it since now the structure is mutable. We can have something that is templated. So in this case, we have T and we can see that we can type actually the I, the elements of a structure, in this case with the type parameter t. And we can see that this is uh, my same type pair of integers, my same type pair of strings, but we cannot have my same type pair of anything else. And actually you can also partially type uh, elements of the structure in the sense that you can type one, but maybe not another. So we can see that the, this must be, a, uh, yeah, because I had already defined this pair. So yeah. uh, you would have to define another, uh, define, uh, another structure. So let's, um, My pair version two stacked. First, uh, that must be maybe is a string. Second, must be a float thirty two. Only a float for sixty four. And then we will get an error if we try to define a pair when the first version to when my, the first element is not the string and the second is not the flux before. Okay, Luca, I think we've got two questions. Yes. Uh, mutable stack to a name tap. Well, the name of tuple is not is immutable. The immutable struct is uh, in some sense similar to an emet tuple, but in the, for the name tuple, we only have uh, adding, we are only adding a name to access the element of the tuples. With the struct, we are actually creating a new type and we can actually 
we will not see it today, but we can actually create uh, constructors for uh, the for the tuple. And while immutable structures, well, there is a strong push towards immutability in the sense that if you modify it, you maybe you you instead of if you want to modify instead you copy and add the modified and create a new element this can be a little this reduces uh, some kind of errors and um, because you always create something new since it can in some cases be inefficient what you have is that you can have also mutable structures. Let's say, for example, in a language like Clojure, that is um, everything is immutable by default. When to create, instead of modifying, you create a new element, and you can actually be quite efficient in doing this. Okay, so going forward, we can an important thing that we have is multiple dispatch, which uh, I think it is well exposed in the uh, the Julia Con uh, 2019 talk, which is the unreasonable effectiveness of multiple dispatch. And the thing is, multiple dispatch can be used to call different implementations of the same function depending on the types of all the arguments. So let's us define this function h four times, but each time. Okay, I will answer shortly to the question of immutability, but let's ask, you know, with multiple dispatch, well, let us define four times the same function, each time with different arguments. In Synodal, we have a generic function so with four methods. That is, we have four different implementations of the same uh, function. And as you can see, if we call it the function with different arguments, we, can, we call different implementations. Julia will call, if we have different implementation, the more specific one, if one exists. Give us an error if no implementation for the specific set of parameters that we have exist. And in fact, we can use methods, the function methods, to see all the methods that we have for a single function. So the function h can have as four different implementations depending on four different combinations of its arguments. And if you look at the method, for example, for plus, you can see that actually plus has 184 methods defined. So we have plus between a date and a day, the date and the year, begin to um, between big integers, so the integer with a bit of precision, floats between uh, complex numbers and so on. And you can see, for example, also between the matrices, between a toy diagonal, uh, two toy diagonal matrices and so on, we have one important thing that we have is now that we can, if we have a new types and it makes sense to define plus on the new type, we can simply define plus. And then when uh, the argument of the function will be of the, of the new types that uh, we have, then the correct implementation will be called. So 
we can have multiple implementation of the same function. And since the most specific one will be called, depending on the types of the argument, what we have is that we can write a code that is generic. For example, we can write a linear algebra code using plus, times, and so on, without bothering to check to use a specific function, maybe for a diagonal matrix instead of uh, um, a triangular matrix and so on. What we have is that if the arguments are, for example, a diagonal matrix, then the plus and times will, will be the uh, code will be the ones for the specific kind of matrix that we have. Now, before moving to environment, to macros, just a few things that I will leave in the, um, in the notebook is that you can create what's in Python, maybe I j to lens and uh, directly inside Julia, for example, and you can, with the close square bucket, enter from the Julia, Julia app the control, the package management. Actually, you can activate an environment. And when you activate an environment, you can, if there are, um, there are nothing is present, then the manifest and the project file I created in the and uh, when you add packages, they are works only inside the environment. So you can have different environments with different packages installed without any conflict. At least I will keep it on the notebook only for as a note for you. And uh, we're going to the last part. Uh, as for the, is possible to find cluster with constructor and class methods. You can find cluster with constructors. Uh, class methods, maybe you want something that takes a type as argument. And usually uh, what you have. And, um, but what you have is, Many cases that uh, you don't define, uh, let's say you define, me, um, you, mean you define methods, methods are say part of function. If uh, you are familiar a little bit with uh, uh, the clause, common lisp of the systems, it is maybe more similar to this that for to a traditional and say Python like. Uh, or Lisp or uh, Java-like object system. So let's move to macros. Macros are a form of metaprogramming. What it is actually codes that write code. So they are very well known in Lisp, but they are gaining popularity also in other languages. For example, you say uh, Rust macros again some tractions and so on. Recall that when you pass something to a function, all the arguments to a function are evaluated before being passed. Arguments to a macro are not evaluated. The macro receives a piece of code, a, pres a presentation of a piece of code as an argument. Macro in Julia always have the S sign before them, and why they not be they should not be used extensively since they are more difficult to debug and more uh, difficult to write. They can also be very useful. For example, some useful macro we have the at time macro. We have at time and a piece of code. The piece of code will be executed and the total time, total allocation by four will be returned. 
we have the at which marker that returns for a function call exactly which of the different methods is called. So we know that which for three plus five is plus, where it is a union of in, for all the integers. And you can actually inspect how Julia generates code in the different steps of the code generation by using the different marker for code lowered, which actually takes the code and returns it as a series of one function call and one assignment per, per, um, yeah, per line. Code type it, which is the same but with the, the inferred type annotation. Code at LVM, this is probably the most difficult to write, is for the LLVM compiler that is used to generate the code. And then you can also go to code native, which is actually the assembly code that is generated by Julia. So you can actually inspect if you want to go into all the details, what code is generated by Julia. Yeah. And uh, well, you can also expand a macro in the sense you can see what are the code that is generated by macro by using another macro, macro expand. So macro expand times the three plus five, it turns actually this code that is generated for starting from t plus five by the macro timed. And why it is not so easy to read, this means that uh, the, this code, if you can see, takes the, some information about the garbage collector, the current time, execute the instruction, and the time, the number of uh, allocations and the times of the execution. And you can actually represent and modify code in multiple ways in Julia, for example, by quoting it or by using this syntax, the colon, and then inside, usually to disambiguate inside the parentheses, a piece of code. The, what is the type of the code is an expression. If we, we want to represent it as a symbolic expression, uh, this means that this piece of code, p plus five, is a call to the function plus with argument to m5. And we can see that we can actually inspect all the arguments. And uh, we can also modify part of the argument. For example, the first element of the arguments of the call is plus, but we don't want plus, we want times. Now, code two is three times five, and if we evaluate it, we have 15. Okay, let's see if there is some question, and then I will go quite fast on the linear algebra part. Okay, okay, one observation on the well, Julia is not object oriented in the traditional sense, but uh, it is object oriented in the same way as common Lisp as an object oriented part, where everything, uh, where the, say, well, common Lisp object system, it is considered an object system, but quite different. So it is. I would argue that uh, for some definition of object orientation, uh, Julian can be considered object oriented. Curl is a function of programming body of concatenated functions. Can you expand a little bit on this question? And the 
I didn't understand what the uh, code uh, one equal quote uh, does. Code is a different thing. Is a is a new concept of uh, Julia. Uh, yeah, the quote simply represents instead of do may say no, do not evaluate the code. Actually, let's write. Do not evaluate the code, simply give a, me a representation of the code that I can manipulate before evaluating it. So, since we are near the end of the first lecture, let's go fast within algebra. We can uh, use the word random, the functional random to generate, for example, a random matrix of three by three random matrix, a length three vector, we can, uh, since it is a very common operation to solve the linear systems, so Julia has this operator in the backslash, and the result will be at the uh, result of the linear systems. We, uh, in the documentation, you can see that how it behaves when we have an, uh, something that is over or under specified, but Still works uh, usually given the least square solution. Since we have multiple dispatch, actually, times for, a for a multiplication between array and vector or between two matrices, exponentiation of matrices, everything works. Trans multiplication between the vector and its transpose still works. And actually, some since it is defined generically for everything that can be summed, we can sum an array of matrices, and they will be summed element by element, of multiply them. And uh, if we use something like the package linear algebra, which is included in the base uh, libraries, You can, for example, find the eigenvectors, but you have more the standard function or that you can find, for example, with the BLAS and so on, they are all in uh, the linear algebra package. You can add a single value composition. And is, since you have multiple dispatch, you have one function of single value composition, but uh, we have many implementation depending is the function, for example, is diagonal, be diagonal and uh, and so on. So, for example, if we create a diagonal matrix, when we see all the elements are on the diagonal, single the decomposition, it's performed, and as you can observe with the macro which, we can see which one is called. And we see that we, the specific implementation for diagonal matrices is called. And similarly, we can create a lower triangular matrices from the matrix A. We find a singular value decomposition. And we can see that we are calling the abstract triangular implementation of the singular value decomposition. So with uh, four triangular matrices. And to the end, and then for the final version of this notebook, I will add some extras. The end, I will leave you with some, this kind of Julia code that is also valid, Julia code. So if there is any question, please ask. Okay, while we are waiting for uh, possible questions, I wanted to, um, to notify you all that um, um, the Elettra has uh, told me that there are still some virtual machine uh, spots available. So uh, if some of you want to, uh, wants to grab one of these spots, just uh, fill in the form uh, which I sent uh, in the chat, and uh, we will uh, answer you as soon as possible. 
Uh, as soon as possible with the, with the response. So we do the so, with the sun. Moon also with the sun. <laughs> well, it depends why a unicorn the, diff, the sun is, because uh, we are actually taking a range of unicorn code points between this and within the two characters uh, and putting everything in between. Uh, the next letter will be next, mon next Monday. Uh, from 11 to 13 as today. Only the last lecture will be in a different, uh, will be uh, later. Okay, so. Okay, well, I typed it in a Sorry? I typed one plus one and it took maybe half a second to enter. This is a second call. Okay, this is something else. This is uh, also sometimes called uh, time to first plot problem. The thing is, Jul Julia is compiled. So the first time you use, uh, you run something, it has to compile it. The other times already it allows you have the optimized code and uh, works wonderfully. So in fact, in many cases, if you you can have that the same function call can have a lot also many can also the second call is a lot faster and with many uh, with not many allocations because the first allocation has to compile everything. So, okay, thank you. Okay, what does one means in array in C4 one, which is uh, the dimensionality of the array. The array is of in C4 uh, and it is one dimensional array. A two dimensional array will be array in C4 two. Okay. okay, if there are no more questions, I think that uh, we can we can end the, the meeting.